Jewish Audio on Kaban.org. The hero in you. That's the topic tonight. So Larry received a gift from a friend. It was a parrot. It wasn't his first choice of what he would like to have as a gift, but he figured, you know, he's living in a bachelor's apartment all alone, and it'll add some color, some life to his boring life. So he buys this beautiful cage with all the fancy tchotchkes for a parrot. And this parrot, on the very first day, opens its mouth. And it wasn't pleasant. It was quite insulting. Hey, fat Larry, how you doing today? Everything that came forth from this parrot's mouth was an insult. If that wasn't bad enough, he started using foul language. Real bad. Every single day. Larry tries being real nice to the parrot. And how are you today? Why do you have to talk about us? You know, to talk this way, be nice, be gentle. Everything that was tried didn't help. The parrot was just insulting, terrible. He started yelling at the bird. Didn't help, it got worse. He shook the bird. The bird got angrier and ruder. And finally, in this absolute moment of desperation, Larry just picked up the bird, opened the freezer, and put the bird in the freezer. Waited a few minutes. For a few moments, he heard the bird squawking, kicking, screaming, and then suddenly, quiet. A minute goes by, not a sound. Larry's now worried. Maybe I hurt the bird. Opens the freezer door. The bird walks out, jumps onto Larry's hand, and says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I might have offended you with my language. My apologies for the actions the last few days. I ask your forgiveness. I will endeavor to correct my behavior. Larry was astonished at the bird's change in attitude and was about to ask what caused this dramatic change when the parrot said, Can I ask you one question, Larry? Sure. Tell me, what did the chicken inside there do? So there was a very wealthy and influential man. He was being pursued by the Israeli government. The Israeli government wanted very much for this very wealthy fellow to come on a mission to Israel. They really wanted him for his contribution, perhaps, that he could make, for his influence. And each year, the prime minister of Israel made no difference with it, which administration would call this man and say, please, can you make it? We'll have a mission for you, high class, we'll take you everywhere, helicopters, limousines, all first class, whatever it is that you're going to need. Nothing doing, not interested. And finally, Prime Minister Netanyahu gets a call from this fellow, I'm ready to come to Israel, but I have one condition, whatever it is. Well, the condition is I have to bring my dog along. Prime Minister Netanyahu says, no problem whatsoever, I'll take care of the arrangements. He calls El Al. I want this man in first class. I want you to have a special doggy compartment on that flight. I want lassie movies going on the entire time. You've got to make that dog comfortable. I want VIP treatment all the way. Nothing held back. No problem. Fellow gets on this flight. His dog is put into this dog compartment. The flight lands in Israel. The baggage handler takes a look in the dog compartment. And oy vey, as they say, the dog is dead. Oh, my God. They inform El Al. El Al calls the prime minister's office. We have a problem here. The fellow, the high-class fellow, the fellow that nothing held back, the dog, the dog is dead. Prime Minister Netanyahu says, this is a mess. It's a disaster. He calls the head of the Mossad. He says, you're the head of the Mossad. This is an emergency. I need an exact match. I need an identical dog. You're the Mossad. You can do everything. You're the number one agency in the world. There's nothing you can't do. The Mossad locates a picture of the dog as the dog came on the plane. They find a matching dog. They get a plastic surgeon to make minor touch-ups real quick. They keep the fellow busy in in, in, in the airport in Israel, keeping him busy, giving him drinks, and dining him, saying the dog will will bring you your dog momentarily. Within an hour and a half, everything is ready. They switch the dogs. They put this new dog in the cage, and they bring the dog out to the master. The fellow takes a look. Prime Minister Netanyahu is there. He says, is everything okay? Takes a look at the dog and he faints. They revive him. Did he figure it out? And he says to the Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister, Israel is indeed a holy and miraculous land. 
I brought my dog here for burial, and look, he's back to life. (laughs) So, on the subject of Israel, a number of years ago, I had the opportunity, the schus, the honor, of leading a solidarity mission to Israel. I've been to Israel many a times. I've seen the land through the eyes of a tourist, a visitor, leader of study group journeys to the Holy Land. Every trip to Israel, every trip that you have taken is meaningful, is inspirational. But that particular mission was significantly different. That mission was taken in the midst of the Antifada. Tourism came to a dead halt. If you recall that period of time, suicide bombings of buses and cafes were nightly news material. So our community felt that we couldn't simply sit sit back and do nothing. So a group of some three, four dozen of us decided to go. We were going to go to tell the people of Israel that our thoughts are with them every day and every night. This was a mission to comfort the bereaved and to share their pain. A mission to visit with those who were wounded physically, emotionally, by the horrors of what was going on during those years of terrorism. On one of our stops, we visited an active military base on the Lebanese border. And we asked the leading officer there if there was anything we can do for the soldiers. And he told us that two of the officers came from very poor families. They had no fathers in that household. And that these boys were the breadwinners for their families. And now that they've been called up for extended duty, they were worried all day about their families who would feed them. Immediately, the group of us put together a decent collection and we gave it to them. And you felt at every stop there was this true kinship, a bond that we felt, especially with the soldiers. A colonel who arranged this tour of the military base for us, this is a man who led a tank brigade in the Yom Kippur War. And when he was on our bus talking to us, this man, this very brave man, he broke down and he cried. And he thanked us for coming when so few were doing the same. One of our congregants who helped put together this mission, Tom Block, he was instrumental in raising over $65,000 to distribute directly to families in need, families that lost loved ones in a terrorist attack. And throughout the trip, he was trying to pick up words in Hebrew. So we were there at this military base. He was getting back on the bus, and he wanted to say goodbye to the soldiers outside the bus. And he yells out, you are all my gibor, my heroes. You're my heroes. And the soldiers were so moved by this outburst of pure emotion, this this love and admiration They felt it was so deep and so pure, so real. And the soldiers yelled back, No, Atem Giborim, you are the heroes. And we all started to sing and dance, got back off the bus, everybody dancing again with the soldiers. It was this honor, this pride that we felt to be in the presence of greatness. And it had this very powerful effect on us. And when we left that military base, it was very quiet on the bus. Everyone was deep in reflection, thinking about what had just taken place. And we knew this one thing. We all wished that we could be a hero too. You see, I don't think that any of us are here to live a life of mediocrity, of ordinariness. We're all here to live a life of greatness, of being a gibor, not a strong man. A great man, a great woman, a hero. Within each and every single one of us, there is a desire, perhaps even more than a desire, a need, a need to be special, a hero of some kind, in some way to know that we matter in a very unique, special way, that we make a difference, a significant difference, not by being someone else, 
not by being someone we're not, but by me being me and you being you, by both of us striving for greatness in the lives that we live, in the lives that we were given, in the roles that we play. You see, society and the world at large throughout all of history looked at greatness in very different eyes than Judaism. Military strongmen, the world considered great. The wealthy are considered great. The one that can climb the highest peak is great. The one that hits the most home runs is great. Actors and actresses, they're heroes to so many. Great. Heroes of society. For some strange reason, we associate slim bodies and fast sports cars with being special. After all, that's what's on every billboard in our country. That's what's modeled. That's greatness. Judaism comes along and says, greatness is about being good. It's about living with dignity and doing everything within our power to help others live that way. It's doing the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. Greatness is being respected and loved by the people in our lives who really matter. Greatness is about sacrifice. It's about family. It's about community. It's not about 50,000 screaming fans in the stadium that never met you and have absolutely no idea who you really are. It's not about millions of admirers that see you act in some movie. The Torah models greatness for us. Who were the heroes of the Bible? Who are the heroes of Jewish history? It was not the pharaohs. It wasn't the conquerors. It was the shepherds. It was the scholars. It was the lovers of people. It was Abraham and Sarah. What heroic act did they do? Why were they selected to be the father and mother of the Jewish people? Because they were kind. Because they opened their home and their tent so that others can eat. That's the heroes of the Bible. Moses, Miriam, King David, Hillel's, Maimonides, Baal Shem Tov's, they were all reluctant to take center stage. They all sought no glory in their lives, but glory found them. Their primary purpose was righteousness, not recognition. It was virtue, not victory. It was moral courage and not mortal conquest. Their desire to serve God was more important than their desire to be popular with the masses. And in their days, they may not have been the hero. They may not have been the most popular, the glorious. But our history, Jewish heritage, records them for their true greatness. You see, our history has a way of sifting through society's so-called heroes and weeding out those who don't belong on this list. Think for a moment. How would Moses' obituary been written if it was written today? If a newspaper article of some New York Times editorial was going to write an obituary for Moses today, it would sound something like this. Moses, the failed leader of the Jewish people, whose sole goal was to lead them to the promised land, died today short of fulfilling his ambition. His career was filled with rebellion, strife, and constant revolts against his leadership. He led a nation in the wrong direction, heading into the wilderness instead of up the Mediterranean coastline, he caused suffering due to shortages of water and food. Under his leadership, the people formed a golden calf. A man who simply never made it has passed on. That's the way we would read his story. And yet, the Torah tells us there was never and will never be another man as great as Moses. You begin to see the difference the way society looks 
at a person's role in life and the way Torah looks at a person's role with life. The Torah says this was a man who spoke to God, a man who studied with God, a man who taught us the Torah, who performed miracles for our ancestors, and yet was the humblest of man to ever walk this planet. That's Jewish greatness. That he can speak to God and yet at the same time feel as humble as if he was just anybody else. There are no pyramids marking Moses' grave. There's not even a tombstone. But in his deeds, his kindness, his lasting legacy, that's the tombstone of Moses. The heroes of Judaism don't need to hold on to center stage to be noticed. They don't need to crush people to be noticed. They simply need to be the best that they can be. On September 11th of 2001, this country and the world saw with their eyes the truer meaning of the word hero. And who are they? Ordinary people. Police officers, firefighters, paramedics, throwing themselves without hesitation into harm's way and even into the very clutches of death for the sake of their fellow man. Heroism in the acts of simple human beings, of those carrying down strangers 65 flights of stairs, or the passengers on flight number 93, or the thousands who waited online to give blood. The ordinary became giants on that day. We aspire for greatness in our lives when we witness greatness in others. When the firemen and the teachers are the heroes of society, instead of rock and roll singers, it affects us all. We aspire for greatness in our own lives. When we surround ourselves with other great people. When we live with the champions of spirit, then we too want to strive for greatness. I had the good fortune to grow up inspired and touched by true heroes of goodness and courage. To the Lubavitcher Rebbe, no human life was unimportant. No Jew was too distant. There was no such thing as a soul too hopeless. He believed in us. He cared for us. He loved us. And he challenged us every single day of our lives to reach greater heights. An elderly Hasid Rabbi Yosef Weinberg related a story. How late one night he was called by an acquaintance who had an emergency. And he asked Rabbi Weinberg if he could do him a favor. Can you write a note to the Lubavitcher Rebbe and ask him for a blessing for this particular emergency? It was late at night. Rabbi Weinberg ran to 770 Eastern Parkway where the Rebbe's office was. And he saw that the light in the Rebbe's office was still on. But he went to the secretary's office and that office was already closed. They had already gone home. He quickly wrote up a note to the Rebbe requesting this blessing. The Rebbe's door was closed. So he took the note and he slipped it under the door. As soon as he did that, he was filled with tremendous regret. Because he realized to himself that was so disrespectful. I slip a note under the Rebbe's door so the Rebbe has to go now and bend down to pick up the note. Is that respectful? And he felt terrible about it. So the next morning he wrote a note of apology to the Lubavitcher Rebbe for slipping a note under the door and causing you to have to bend down to lift the note. The Rebbe's secretary went looking for Rabbi Weinberg and said, the Rebbe would like to see you. And he comes into the Rebbe's office all embarrassed by this whole exchange and the Rebbe said, why did you apologize? What was that note all about? My whole life is dedicated to bending down and lifting up those who are down. This is what I do. This is what I do for a living. I bend down to lift people up. All his life he strived to lift up others, individuals and mankind as a whole, to lift us up from the complacency, from the mediocrity, and the fatigue to which human nature easily and often resigns itself. He evoked within us the creativity and the excellence within each and every single one of us. And the Rebbe empowered us with our own God-given endowments. To the Rebbe, no crisis was beyond repair. 
no dilemma was beyond resolution. He built a Jewish world up from the ashes of the Holocaust. And he built schools, yeshivas, synagogues, libraries, mikvahs, thousands of Chabad centers span the globe. A new Jewish reality was born. One great man who challenged us all to be great ourselves. There was a 20-year-old who once wrote a letter to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He was in yeshiva. He was unsure about his own future, which direction it would take or which direction he wanted it to take. And he was offered a working position that would take him out of yeshiva life, away from a daily pursuit of Torah learning, away from the spiritual environment of the yeshiva. But it was an opportunity he wanted to pursue. So he asked his father what to do. His father advised him to ask the Rebbe for guidance. So this 20-year-old boy wrote a long letter, a personal letter to the Lubavitcher Rebbe asking for advice. Not only did the Rebbe find the time to answer this 20-year-old, not only did the Rebbe surprise him with a response that he should take the job offer, but the Rebbe went on to give him very clear instructions as to what his daily schedule should be. And the Rebbe requested and received frequent reports as to his progress. Now this story may not be so special to all of you, but it was very special to me because I was that 20-year-old boy. While learning under some of the greatest Torah scholars in the Rabbinical College of Canada, I was asked to come out to Westlake Village and take care of a small Chabad center. I didn't know what to do. Stay in yeshiva, learn with these great scholars, or come out to Westlake Village. And I put it all into writing and I asked the Rebbe for guidance. The Rebbe had confidence in me. The Rebbe directed me. He cared for me. And it is his confidence and his faith that inspired me to devote my life to his calling. We aspire for greatness in our lives when we witness greatness in others. I have another hero in my life. My father. May he live long, happy, and healthy years. My father was the lone survivor of his entire family. He had every excuse to give up on life. But he chose to fight. He chose to seek revenge for the destruction of his family. And he was victorious. He brought 11 children into this world. In the days I grew up, even amongst Hasidim, 11 was a large family. Five or six was big. 11, wow. People kept on asking him, why so many kids? And he would respond, Hitler, Yemach Shemay, took away my family. I'm rebuilding it. And I'm happy that he didn't listen to those who questioned his desire for a large family. See, I was kid number 10. <laughs> to anybody here who has ever believed that having many children is an injustice because it prevents you from giving each child the proper love and attention they need, I say to you that I have living proof that you're very wrong. This sweet man taught me what it means to be a dedicated father, a loving husband, a caring friend. This sweet man taught me that to be a chassid means to be gentle and kind-hearted and honest and to live your life according to your beliefs no matter what the circumstances. This sweet man taught me that nothing, nothing can come in the way of faith and devotion to God and that this faith can indeed conquer all. This hero of life saw it all, survived it all, and still manages to smile and sing his way through life. This hero got his revenge because today there are over 80 children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of this one sweet man, my hero, my father. I don't aspire to be like my father because I'll never be like him. But being around him and being near him and being near people like a Lubavitcher Rebbe makes me aspire to be as great as I can be.
And so I ask you tonight, who are your heroes? Not the shallow, artificial heroes of the sports world or the Hollywood world. Who do you admire because of their goodness? Because of the sacrifice that they make for others? Who do you look up to because of their courage? Who is your hero because of their love? Who do you look up to? Who do your children look up to? Who are the heroes of your grandchildren? Whose posters hang in their bedrooms? And are those people worthy of the admiration and respect that they're getting from the youth in your life? This past year, we mourn the loss of Ilan Ramon's son, Asaf. And I was reminded once again of the heroism of his father, Ilan Ramon. Remember, he was the first Israeli astronaut who died in the space shuttle accident. He was a hero not just because he was an astronaut, and not just because he was a Jewish astronaut, and not just because he was the first Israeli astronaut in space, but it was because of how Ilan Ramon chose to spend his time preparing for his mission and on the mission that truly made him great. Because by his own choice, he chose not just to represent himself and not just to represent Israel, but he decided to represent all of Judaism, all of the Jewish people, and all of Jewish history. Let me remind you of what took place in the months preceding his flight. He spent considerable time studying his Jewish heritage, he spent a lot of time studying with a colleague of mine, Rabbi Tzvi Kanakov of Chabad of the Space Coast. He wanted to learn all about Jewish traditions. He wanted to learn about kosher. Why? So that he can keep kosher in the space shuttle. He wanted to learn about Shabbat so that he can truly keep a complete Shabbat in the space shuttle. Not because he was a religious Jew, but because he wanted to represent our people. And if I'm going to represent them, I'm going to do it right. He knew what it meant to be an ambassador, and he had a message to deliver. And I remember ABC News questioned him, is this not a waste of money to have an astronaut take a complete 24 hours off? You mean you're not going to work a whole Saturday? You don't got too many days up there. You got a big workload. You know, we spend millions of dollars training and preparing for each flight. And his response was so simple. He said, it is important for people to know that there are things more valuable and more powerful than money. Shabbat represents a focus on family life and a focus on God. It represents a focus on community and a focus on friendship. And these will get you beyond any experiment we can possibly do in the space shuttle in that time. More important than any technology to sit with your family around the Shabbat table and sing the Shalom Aleichem. This was Alain Ramon. This was the message he delivered to the world as a Jewish ambassador. Yuri Gagarin, the Soviet cosmonaut, who in 1961 became the first person to orbit the earth, said during his journey, I have searched the heaven and not found God. Well, Ilan Ramon searched earth and found God living in the hearts and souls and homes of every family. I'd like to share a story with you. The year was 1944. The place, the barracks of Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. An old rabbi secretly taught a 13-year-old boy whose name was Joachim Joseph, his bar mitzvah portion. He was born in Berlin, this boy. He was raised in a non-religious home in Amsterdam. He watched as others in his community had a bar mitzvah, and he asked his father if he could have one too. His father said, sure. And before the chance came for his bar mitzvah, the Nazis Yemach Shimam came. Joseph and his brother ended up in Bergen-Belsen, in the same barracks with Rabbi Dasberg. Rabbi Dasberg was the chief rabbi of the Netherlands. 
Rabbi Dasberg took an interest in this boy, Joachim. And Joachim told him that he had a desire to have a bar mitzvah, and it never came to happen. The rabbi asked Joachim, how badly do you still want that bar mitzvah? He said, very badly. Are you willing to risk your life for it? He said, yes. So each night, when the camp was asleep, the rabbi studied with this young boy, his bar mitzvah portion. It was early Monday morning, March of 1944. Some of the men stood guard at the windows to make sure that no SS officer was approaching. The rabbi takes out a tiny Sefer Torah, a tiny Torah scroll. The Torah scroll was four and a half inches tall. The 13-year-old boy, Joachim Joseph, chanted the blessings on the Torah, and he read his portion right there in Bergen-Belsen. Mazel tov, mazel tov, each one greeted the boy. The rabbi hugged the boy and cried. And then he took this small Torah, and he said to Joachim, I know my days here are numbered. I want you to take this Torah. And if God will bless you, that you survive, I want you to take this Torah out with you. And you must tell the world, tell the world, that here in Bergen-Belsen, we had a bar mitzvah on this Torah. Let the world know that even here, in the most evil place on earth, we Jews kept our faith. The world needs to know this. Never give up your hope in tomorrow. Tell the world. Rabbi Dasberg died February 24th, 1945, just a few months before the British liberated the camp. Joachim kept this Torah in his backpack. And just days after the rabbi died, Joachim was liberated. He found himself on a British military ship sailing for Palestine. There he started a new life for himself. But he rarely spoke about his days in the concentration camp. He tried very hard to forget everything. He went to school. He studied atmospheric physics. Got a doctorate here in UCLA in 1966. He became one of Israel's leading physicists. He pioneered many experiments. And it was while working on an experiment of how dust particles affect the climate that he met a young man named Alain Ramon. They became friends. Once, while Ilan was over at Dr. Joseph's house, he noticed a tiny Torah scroll on his shelf. What's this? And for the first time, Joachim Joseph told the story of his bar mitzvah in Bergen-Belsen. Ilan was so moved by the heroics of the story, and he said, Will you give me permission to take this Torah with me into the space shuttle so that all the world could indeed hear the rabbi's message of 1944, so that all can be inspired by this one tiny Torah? And Dr. Joseph agreed. Ilan Ramon was interviewed in a teleconference from from aboard the space shuttle. He took this Torah, this tiny Torah, He held it up in his hand and he said to the entire world, this Torah scroll was given to by a rabbi to a young, scared, thin, 13-year-old boy in Bergen-Belsen. It represents more than anything the ability of the Jewish people to survive. It represents their ability to go from periods of darkness to reach periods of hope and faith in the future. The astronauts took many experiments with them into space. Most of that data was lost as Columbia disintegrated on its way back to Earth. But the Torah experiment of Ilan Ramon, its data was not lost. Its message lives on. A Torah who made its appearance in the very depths of hell made its last appearance and the heights of heaven. These are heroes, my dear friends. Ilan Ramon doesn't make us us aspire to be astronauts. He makes us aspire to be great, to want to live on a higher plane, to be a hero too, to want each day to mean something in our lives, not just minutes ticking away. 
Viktor Frankl writes in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, that even amid the horrors of the Nazi death camps, he was able to maintain his dignity by maintaining choice. He says the Nazis could strip him of his happiness by murdering his family. They could strip him of his home by incarcerating him like an animal in hell. They could strip him of his name by placing a number on his arm. But there was one thing they could never take from him, which he retained throughout the horrors of his time in the death camps. And that was how he chose to respond to each new indignity. While they can take away his bread, they couldn't take away his determination to share whatever crumbs he had with his fellow inmates. While they can take away his future, they couldn't take away his capacity to give hope to his fellow prisoners. The Nazis could determine where Frankl was, but they could not determine who he was. That was a choice that only he would make. And this, my dear friends, must be our task. To determine who we are. No one else can make that determination. No conditions can dictate our ability to overcome any obstacles, to be the great person we were designed to be. Great in our lives. Great in our day-to-day living. Great in the trenches of our own existence. There is a legend in the, in the Medrash where in the Tigris River was once asked, why is it that you always roar so loudly? You cause such a commotion. To which the river answered, were it not for my roar, how would people take notice of me? I want to be known that I exist. And so I call attention to myself by being this noisy river that I am. The opposite question was then posed to the Euphrates River. Why is it that you're always so very calm, so quiet, and so peaceful? Well, said the Euphrates, the soil around me is so fertile that if a man were to plant trees along my banks within but three short years, the saplings would spring forth. If he were to plant vegetables alongside me, it wouldn't be 30 days before beautiful, edible results would emerge. So you see, said the Euphrates, I don't have to make noise or cause a great deal of commotion in order to be noticed. My deeds speak for themselves. We don't need to make noise to be great. Our deeds need to speak for themselves. In 1940, as Hitler was tightening his net of evil and madness around Eastern Europe, Jews were running for their lives. Many were living in Lithuania, which had been annexed by the Soviet Union, and many thousands more came there from Poland to seek refuge. The people could see the writing on the wall. They knew that it was only a matter of time before Lithuania would become a place of blood and destruction at the hands of the Nazis. But where to run? How to run? No country were exactly opening their arms to Jewish refugees. One day someone discovered a loophole involving the Dutch and Soviet councils that would grant the Jews of Lithuania safe passage. But this elaborate plan, however, was contingent upon one thing the refugees had to have an official Japanese visa in hand. Visa from the Japanese consulate. That would be their only escape. The Japanese consulate in Lithuania was a one-man operation administered by a very humble and understated individual named Chiyun Sugihara. When the notion of issuing Japanese visas to the Jewish refugees were presented to this diplomat, he had a decision to make. He knew that his government would be adamantly opposed to such a thing. So for him to do this would mean going against his ministry, that his career would essentially be over, and that he and his family would be disgraced. He and his wife looked at the throngs of refugees, men, women, and children, and suddenly they knew that there was no choice after all. In Shiyun Sugihara's own words, I may have to disobey my government, But if I don't, I would be disobeying God. And so from July 31st to August 28th, 1940, Chuyin Sugihara sat for hours and hours signing visas. Hour after hour, day after day, he wrote these visas with his own hands. Knowing that his days at the council were numbers, he didn't eat, he didn't sleep. 
His wife would feed him sandwiches as he sat at his desk writing visas. And when his hands would tire, she would massage his fingers and encourage him to write on. With each passing day, the lines of refugees in front of the council would get longer and longer, and Sugihara's writings would intensify. Eventually, his government got wind of his actions. They ordered his transfer to Berlin. But up to the very last minute, he didn't stop writing visas. Visas for life. Even as his train was pulling out of the station, his body was arched out of the window, handing visas to anxious Jews waiting on the platform. He then handed over the visa stamp to a refugee, and many more Jews were granted life as a result. After receiving their visas, the refugees lost no time in getting on the train that took them through Russia, with most of them continuing on to Kobe, Japan, where they were allowed to stay for several months until being sent to Shanghai, China and from there to all parts of the world. All 6,000 Polish Jews who were issued those visas survived in safety. The second largest number of Jews saved during World War II by an individual. In 1945, the Japanese government unceremoniously dismissed Shiyun Sugihara from diplomatic service for his defiant and disobedient actions and he and his family were sent into exile. He had to start his life all over again. He was without a job for over a year. For two decades, he was considered persona non grata in his own native country. It was only in later years that this man would receive the recognition and commendations that he deserved. And in 1985, before his death, he was recognized as righteous among the nations by the Yad Vashem Remembrance Authority. One postscript to the story that those of you that know me would know. On August 15, 1940, Chiyun Sugihara issued visa number 1778 to a 17-year-old yeshiva boy who had been separated from the rest of his family, from his parents, his brother, and his sisters, whom he would never see again. I share this particular visa with you because the bearer of visa number 1778, dated August 15, 1940, is my father, Rabbi Mordechai Meir Brisky. It's due to the courage and compassion of a simple human being, a quiet person who simply did the right thing at the right time that I'm able to stand before you today. In fact, it is estimated that today there are more than 45,000 descendants of Sugihara survivors living throughout the world. All owe their existence to a simple man who chose to do the right thing. It's not always the big. Sometimes it's the small little actions. Sometimes it's the small deeds that could matter more. There was a Rosh Yeshiva. Rosh Yeshiva is a dean of a yeshiva of a rabbinical school, and he once called over a high school student. Now, merely getting called over by the dean, if you're a high school student, was intimidating. Like, "Uh uh-oh, what did I do now? He gets called over by morning services, thinking he must have done something wrong. Why is he calling me over? And the rabbi says, I want you to do me a favor. Yeah. I want the next time that you pray, I want you to have me in mind. I want you to think of me. And the boy says, I should think of you? I'm just a little stinker here. I'm a little kid. I mean, you're, you're, you're the big man. Here. You're the holy rabbi of the school. Why should I, why would you want me to think of you? And he said, because I found out what you do every Friday afternoon after school. You see, this boy on his own would go visit a senior home. And he would visit the senior citizens and sing to them, and talk to them, just because. No one asked him to do it. And when this Rosh Yeshiva heard about this behavior of this child, he was so moved that he said, you pray for me. You're my hero. We don't have to make noise to be great. We just have to do the right thing. You don't have to live in Calcutta to be kind to hungry people. No, you may never be Mother Teresa, but who said you're supposed to be? Who said you have to be? 
You need to simply be kind to hungry people that come along your path in life. To those who are hungry for food, or those that are hungry for love, or those that are hungry for Judaism, those that are hungry for spirituality or for godliness, we need to feed them. And that's being a hero. You know, no one can bestow upon us a sense of greatness more than our own children. There is nothing that can be more gratifying when your kid gets an assignment in school to write about their hero and they write about you. Oh, does that feel good. But my dear friends, we need to earn that title. We need to stop looking at our children as if they are only a preparation for some day in the future. It's not always about goal orientation. It's not always about the finished product. It's not always even about good grades. It's not always about getting into Ivy League schools. Having children is always about today. It's about celebrating each day with them of life because this moment has value. We give them lots of skills and we can give them tennis lessons and piano lessons and art lessons and send them from instructor to instructor, but the greatest thing we can possibly give them is the sacrifice of our own time. The greatest thing we can give them is our own love. The greatest thing we can give them is our own attention. Children are not just here so that they can grow up and become somebody. Children are somebody today. This moment with them has value. This moment has meaning. Each and every single moment with them is precious. You know the feeling that comes over you? When you start looking at old pictures and old videotapes, you know, you see your kids when they were five years old, you see, oh, it's so cute, right? And you sit around with everyone you can't, you can't, wow. Well, why can't the moment of real life be just as precious as watching an old videotape? If this particular moment will be precious ten years from now, why can't it be precious right now? When you're tired and you're exhausted and you just come home from a long, hard day, And your kid says, can you help me with some homework? Be a hero. Run to do it. Not because if not, your kids are not going to get a good grade. Chances are that your memory of geography is pretty lousy. And your kid knows it far better than you. Run to do it because your kid wants to study with you. That's precious. And that's greatness. You take for granted the time you spend with them, but they don't take it for granted. They treasure it. They long for it. There's a story about a mother who came to Gandhi to ask him to tell her son to stop eating so much sugar. He's ruining his teeth. If you ask him to stop, he will listen to you. Gandhi refused to do it. The mother came back a month later and asked him again. This time he said, okay, I'll speak to your son. So the mother said, why didn't you agree last month when I asked you? So Gandhi said, because last month I was still eating sugar. I couldn't ask him not to eat sugar if I was doing it myself. When we live our lives to set an example for others, then we ourselves change. Then we become better ourselves. There was this fellow who thought he knew a lot about how to raise children. So he went around the country lecturing on the Ten Commandments for Parents. That was the title of his lecture, the Ten Commandments for Parents. He then got married and had a child of his own. And somehow the title of the lecture then changed to Ten Hints for Parents. No more commandments, there are hints for parents. He then had his second child... And he changed the lecture to some suggestions for parents. Then came the third child. He quit lecturing. You see, it's not easy. It has its challenges. But there's nothing more valuable. And the same can be said, perhaps even more so, to those of you who are bubbies and zaydis. The nachas you get from Eneklach from your grandchildren, can fill your days and nights with joy. Be their hero. My my little granddaughter now points to this little, you know, the cereal Quaker Oats, and she points to that guy on Quaker Oats saying, Zaydi, Zaydi! I thought it was cute. 
I got to get her a picture of me instead. Be their hero. If you have grandchildren, take them out with you. Take them to shul once in a while. Bring them over for Shabbos. Be the Bubby and Zaidi that you may have had growing up. Our grandchildren need their grandparents in their lives. An elderly woman and her little freckled-faced grandson spent the day at the zoo. Lots of children were waiting in line to get their cheeks painted by this artist who was decorating them with tiger paws. A girl was waiting in line and told this little freckled-faced boy, you got so many freckles, there's no place to paint. The little boy was all embarrassed, and he started to cry. The girl made fun of him. His bubby knelt down next to him and told him, I love your freckles. When I was a little girl, I always wanted freckles. And she began tracing her fingers across the child's cheek. Freckles are beautiful. The boy looked up and said, really? Of course, said the grandmother. Just name me one thing that's prettier than freckles. The little boy thought for a moment, peered intensely into his bubby's face, and softly said, wrinkles? (laughs) We have to be a hero in every possible way. In our own community here, we offer a friendship circle program. That's to bring joy and laughter to hundreds of children with special needs throughout our community. And who are the heroes of this program? Teenagers. We turn to teenagers and we train teenagers to befriend these children and give up of their time to become these children's best friends. And it's a magnificent program, and I encourage you to spend a Sunday sometime just watching and observing the magic that takes place in your own community. Visit a Sunday circle program where you will see these teens and these children interact, and your entire week will be lifted. So several years ago, there was this woman in our community. She told me this story. She took her family to a local pizza parlor. And she has a child with special needs. She has an autistic child, an autistic son. And when she came into the pizza shop, her autistic child began acting up and causing a disturbance to all the other people in the restaurant. He started going over from one table to the next, picking up the fries on one table, taking the pizza off another table. It was humiliating. It was embarrassing. Everyone was sending dirty looks her way like, can't you control your kid? And the owner of the shop was looking at her, and she got all embarrassed. She apologized profusely, ran out of the pizza store, and she swore to herself that she would never take this child again out to a public eatery. The humiliation was too much to bear. In the years since that episode, this family got involved with the Friendship Circle. And in all this time, she still stayed true to this promise of never again subjecting her family to this public shame and humiliation. But one day recently, however, due to whatever circumstances, she was stuck. She needed to pick up food at this particular pizza store. And her child was with her and she couldn't leave him in the car. So she figured, you know, I'll just go in, pick up the order, take it out. We'll get out as quickly as possible. And she tells me, I went into the store. My stomach was in knots. I was reliving that past moment. But then she said the most incredible thing happened. The store was packed with teenagers, and they saw my son. And before you knew it, they were yelling out one teenager to the next, Avi, Avi, come to my table. And the other team said, no, we saw him first, come to my table. Because these teenagers that were there knew her son from this friendship circle program, and now they were fighting in that very same store who can have the pleasure of having her son sit with them and join them to eat there. Teenagers can become heroes too. Greatness. We need to strive for greatness in our lives in every aspect of our lives. We need to strengthen our marriages by being better husbands and better wives, by wanting to go out to dinner with our wives more than a night out with the guys. We need to be sweeter, warmer, more considerate. It won't make headlines. Trust me, the Acorn newspaper in the Los Angeles Times will not run a headline. You were nice to your spouse that day. It doesn't make noise. 
but it's our deeds that matter more than our noise. Every time, every time that we refrain from gossip to avoid hurting a friend, we are victorious. Every time we give charity, we are exercising greatness. Every time we fight a moral battle within ourselves and we overcome temptations, we are allowing our true face to shine. You see, life should not be lived in an artificial world. That's not the world of heroes. It's in the real world that we have real struggles with real sacrifices. That's the valley of giants. And that's where a Jew lives. The rabbis taught a zehu gibar. We started with that word tonight. Who is considered a gibar? Who is a real hero? Someone who conquers the world? No. Who is the real hero? It is someone who conquers themselves. Chances are most of us in this room are not going to find a cure for cancer, even though we would love to. Chances are most of us in this room will not win a Nobel Prize. There's a very good chance not a single one of us will ever win an Academy Award. Yet I believe everyone sitting here today has the potential for greatness. I believe everyone sitting here today and everyone listening throughout the world has the potential for heroism, for abundant goodness. You don't have to walk on the moon to feel tall. You don't have to land on Mars to feel like you're out of this world. We can find our magic in life by pushing a child on a swing or comforting a mourner in his home or by visiting the ill or by exercising the power of forgiveness. That's what makes us great. Perhaps, just perhaps, we are put on this earth not just to be happy ourselves, but to make others happy as well. Perhaps we were put on this earth not just to succeed ourselves, but to encourage and applaud the success of others. Perhaps we were put on this earth not just to feed ourselves, but to feed the strangers. This is what the mitzvot are all about. Wherever we turn in the day-to-day life of a Jew, the Torah points us in a direction of goodness. You see, my dear friends, living a Torah life has nothing to do with the label of being orthodox. Don't get caught up with labels. Living a Torah life has to do with living a heroic life. A life where every day is filled with mitzvah, opportunities allowing us to live our lives on a higher plane. It forces us to focus on that which is truly important in our lives. God expects greatness from us. He designed us for greatness. And we should expect no less from ourselves. Judaism grants us the vehicle, the road map, how we get to that level of greatness. We don't have to cross any river to obtain it. And we don't have to defeat any enemies to conquer it. We don't have to lose a hundred pounds to appreciate it. We don't have to travel across the globe or all through the Milky Way to find it. You want to be a hero? Simply strive to do the right thing. Strive to find the godly and the goodly. Strive to bring spirituality and serenity into your life. When we recite on the holidays, the Yisker Memorial Prayer. We are remembering our ancestors. They were indeed giants. Giants who sacrificed it all. Not because they were religious or super pious, but simply because they were Jews. Simple Jews. And their lives and their existence is nothing short of heroic in the truest sense of the word. At the turn of the 20th century, in the city of Tzfas, Israel. There lived a rabbi known as the Ridvaz. His name was Rabbi Yaakov David Rovovsky. One year, on the day of his father's yard site, it was very cold and nasty outside. The Ridvaz braved the cold. He walked to the synagogue and he waited for the minion to come for the afternoon service for the mincha so that he can say Kaddish for his father. As he's standing there leaning on the podium, 
It's his father's yurt site. He starts to think about his father, and suddenly people notice that he's crying. Out of respect, most of the congregants, knowing that he had yurt site that day, they kept their distance. Look, he's going through something. However, one congregant who felt close enough to the rabbi approached him and they said, Rabbi Yaakov, why are you so upset? Why are you crying today? Your father lived a very long life. He passed away a full life. And besides, he passed away 50 years ago. Why are you crying today? Why the heavy tears? So the Ridva said to him, you know, earlier today, at the morning service, before I left the synagogue, I saw how cold it was outside. And I thought to myself, that rather than walk all the way to the synagogue in this nasty weather, perhaps I should arrange for nine other people to simply come to my house in the afternoon so I can say Kaddish there and wouldn't have to make this long walk in the cold, wet rain. But now I can't forgive myself how I even considered such a thing. What was I thinking? So the man said, and for that you're crying? First of all, what was wrong with that idea? You're an elderly man, and if you would have asked nine of us to simply come to your house, it would have been no imposition on us. We would have gladly done it. That's number one. Number two, you didn't even ask any of us to do it. You just thought about it. You didn't act upon it. Why are you crying about this? So he said, let me explain. I was standing here and I started to think back to life. I started to think about when I was a child, when I was a young boy growing up in Slutsk, Poland. My father arranged for us to have what we called a malamid. There was no day schools, there was no yeshiva, there was a small town. So you hired a tutor, a malamid. The tutor would come to our house and he would teach us. For me, my father wanted the best. The best in this town was a man named Reb Chaim Sender. He was the best Torah teacher in town. Reb Chaim Sender charged a ruble a month and he would come to your house to teach your child for a ruble a month. That was a large sum of money in those days. Especially for my father, he said it was very poor. It was very hard for him to scrape together that ruble on a monthly basis. My father, he said, made a living by building furnaces for people. One winter, business was very bad. There was a shortage of cement and lime, so my father couldn't meet the payments to the teacher. There was no furnaces to build because there was no cement. And therefore there was no income. No income, he couldn't pay the malamit. Three months went by and he still hadn't paid the ruble a month to Reb Chaim Sander. One day, Reb Chaim Sander left a note for my father. And it basically said, if I can't get the money, I'm very sorry, but I'm going to have to find another client. I can't continue teaching without payment. My parents read this note. They were devastated. To them, the study of Torah for me meant everything. They were crushed. That night when my father went to the synagogue, he heard that there was a wealthy man who was complaining that he built this new house for his son and his daughter-in-law who had just gotten married, but they couldn't move in because there was no furnace and it was freezing in the house. And that he was prepared to pay a handsome sum of six rubles if anyone can build a furnace in his house. At this point in the story, the Ridvaz is telling this story to his friend. He begins to cry again. And he says, My father came home that night from the synagogue. He had a conversation with my mother. And then he took a hammer in his hand. And brick by brick, he took apart the furnace in our own home. He took these bricks, went to the new home under construction, built this furnace for the newlyweds, and collected the six rubles. The next morning he took the six rubles and gave it to Rabbi Yankel Sender. And he took to Rabbi Chaim Sender. And he said, three rubles for what I owe you the last three months, and the next three rubles for the next three months of tuition. Ridvaz is telling the story and he says, I stood here and I thought about the sacrifice that my father, that my mother, that my whole family made during that very cold winter in Poland. 
how we all shivered because we had no furnace in our own home just so that I could continue studying with the best teacher in town. That's the type of person my father was. That was the sacrifice he was willing to make for my Jewish education. So how could have I even for a moment thought that I shouldn't brave the cold to say Kaddish for this man when this man froze an entire winter for me? When I thought about that, I cried. Let us learn from the heroism of our ancestors. Because every one of our bubbies and our zaydis and our great-grandparents, this is what they lived with. Every day of their lives as a Jew, from every point of our history, from where they come, they lived a life of heroism, of greatness, just by being themselves. That's what we need to do. We need to be the best we that we can be. The best you that you can be. The best me that I can be. That's the way we find greatness in our own lives. That's the way we find the hero within us. And we live a life of greatness. Thank you very much.